What up, y'all? This is your boy, Mr. Downtown Ray Mello, and you're listening to the Entertainment Report for Thursday, April 16th, 2015, delivering some of the major stories and trends going on in the world of entertainment and beyond. You can follow the show on Facebook or on Twitter, facebook.com slash the Entertainment Report with Ray Mello, that's R-A-Y-M-E-L-O, or on Twitter at the Enter Report. You can listen to the show anytime you want on iHeartRadio. Just search for the Entertainment Report, and it'll take you to the page. At last, somebody is owning up to the Dennis Quaid freakout video, and it's none other than the jokesters at Funny or Die. As the rap previously reported, the 43-second YouTube clip, which appeared to have been shot on a cell phone, captured Quaid verbally flipping out on, quote, the most unprofessional set he's ever been on. Media reports and internet forums like Reddit have previously speculated about whether the video was real or a hoax, and some suggested the notorious video, uh, viral video prankster Jimmy Kimmel was behind Quaid's freakout. But Kimmel denied involvement on Jimmy Kimmel Live Tuesday night. Um, he's, Kimmel said, when I woke up this morning and was being blamed for it, there are two dozen other articles and thousands of comments online suggesting that this is a prank and I am responsible for it. And I have to say that's disappointing. You play like 50 pranks and all of a sudden people don't trust you anymore. The late night host joked, did you ever consider that maybe Dennis was doing voiceover for a new cartoon? That's right, he's playing Dennis Duck. Kimmel was the, was the prime suspect for setting up a hoax similar to the worst twerk fail ever, Girls Catches on Fire, video that went viral in 2013 and was later revealed to be a skit on his show. Quaid, who's 61, is no stranger to on-camera hijinks either, having pranked unsuspecting people several times during an appearance on the Ellen DeGeneres show. A woman in Kuwait claims that the story for Disney's animated mega-hit Frozen was lifted from her book, and she's not about to let it go. Author Monifa Abdullah has filed a copyright infringement suit against Disney and Frozen screenwriter Jennifer Lee, claiming that the plot of the film was pinched from The Snow Princess, a story included in her new book, New Fairy Tales. The suit filed in U.S. District Court in Michigan on Monday says that Monifa, quote, has never licensed or otherwise authorized defendants to copy, distribute, or publicly disseminate New Fairy Tales or The Snow Princess or make derivative works based upon them. Abdullah alleges that, quote, the key point, uh, excuse me, the key plot elements, characters, themes, events, set, setting, mood, pace, and dialogue in Frozen demonstrate substantial similarities to The Snow Princess, and that such similarities are of a sort that indicate copyright uh, rather than independent creations or coincidence. According to the suit, The Snow Princess re- revolves around a princess who possesses magical ice powers that gives her the ability to turn people and objects into ice. The princess went into hiding after inadvertently awakening an evil dangerous witch with her powers. Frozen's Princess Elisa, the lawsuit notes, also has the magical ability to turn people and objects into ice and accidentally injures her sister with her powers, isolating herself from others as a result. The suit goes on to cite other alleged similarities, including, quote, a kingdom made of ice and surrounded by mountains, a sibling in search and rescue of the a sibling possessing the magical ice powers, a journey up to the mountain, snowy guards guarding an icy castle on the mountaintop, the idea that only love is capable of defeating evil, and a selfless sacrifice of oneself for the purpose of saving another from being struck by a sword. A spokesperson for, the, for Disney has not yet responded for requests for comment, Alleging four counts of copyright infringement, Abdullah seeking unspecific damages. Director Zack Snyder released a 20-second teaser for Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice on Wednesday via Twitter and confirmed next week's IMAX trailer premiere of the potential blockbuster. While it didn't show footage from the film, the short clip amped up the excitement for the Warner Brothers superhero flick by revealing costumes for both Batman and Superman along with a dramatic soundtrack. Snyder tweeted along with the clip, confirm... Um, April 20, 2015, hashtag Batman vs. Superman at IMAX special teaser screening events limited space RSVP. As reported previously, the first full trailer will premiere at selected IMAX theaters on Monday, April 20th. It is set to debut at special 15-minute theatrical events that fans can buy tickets to attend. One theater chain in Michigan has already set up ticketing pages for the event, though no showtime has been announced. Batman vs. Superman stars Ben Affleck, Henry um, Saville, Jesse Eisenberg, Amy Adams, and Gal Gadot. It will be released on March 25, 2016. 20 years after the release of Friday, Ice Cube says he's ready to head back to the hood to make a fourth film in the franchise. 
He told the rap Wednesday during a sit-down interview, that's my dream. I think all the parties involved, all the people that has been in the franchise, people from the first one to the third one, want to do another one. The entertainment industry veteran who played Craig Jones in Friday, next Friday and Friday after next, stopped by the Cyrus XM Studios in Los Angeles for a round of interviews promoting Friday's return to the big screen. To mark the 20th anniversary of the film's April 1995 release, the cult classic about a day in the life of... Unemployed slackers Craig and Smokey, played by Chris Tucker, will return to theaters for one day only on Monday, April 20th, courtesy of Fathom Events, New Line Cinema, and Warner Brothers. In case you're wondering why it's playing on a Monday instead of Friday, 420 is the police code for smoking marijuana, fitting tribute to the stoner film. Fathom is showing F. Gary Gray's director's cut in selected theaters around the country at 7.30 p.m. local time. They also show Friday Straight Up, a special 24-minute featurette that includes interviews with the cast. He produced and co-wrote the three films with his music collaborator, T.J. Pooh. While the creative team behind Friday is game to make another movie, Cube said there's one thing standing in the way. He says it's really up to the movie companies to step up. When they see stuff like this, they realize how much people love this movie. Sometimes you owe it to the fans to do what the fans want. I hope they step up. As for what to call the next film... Cube already has something in mind. We might have to call it Last Friday because it might end up being the last one. We all, uh, they also asked him his favorite line from Friday, his top choice, Smokey's taunt to Debo, you just got to knock the F out. Another gem by Felicia, Felicia, which has become so popular that it's now a frequent trending tag on social media. For a list of theaters where you can watch Friday on Monday, uh, April 20th, go to Fandango. Harry Connick Jr. took American Idol contestant Quentin Alexander to task on Wednesday's show when the contestant fell out of line following his performance and declared, this whole thing is whack. After a solid rendition of Lenny Kravitz' Are You Gonna Go My Way, Alexander sported quite the surpus, uh, sourpuss look despite getting most positive feedback. Host Ryan Seacrest asked, what's up? This sucks, Alexander said, ge uh, gesturing to the bottom two. We have two of the best vocalists. My best friend is sitting over there. This whole thing is whack, and I'm going to shut up right now. Zechris tried his best to save the increasingly awkward moment. Let me tell you something. The bottom two there, at, at the end, anybody could be saved with that vote. It could be your friend, okay? So let's unwhack it. Then for some reason it sounded like Judge Jennifer Lopez yelled off camera, I love you, baby. Connick Jr. wasn't so supportive of the pot shot. He said, I don't understand at all. I don't get it. He says, asking, are we at a commercial? Uh, Seacrest replied, no, we, no, no, we're live. The, uh, oh, good, the New Orleans singer said. I was going to say, Quentin, if, if it's that whack, then you can always go home because Idol's paying a lot of money to give you this experience, and for you to say that to this hand is that is feeding you right now, I think it's highly disrespectful. Lopez and third judge Keith Urban uncomfortably tried to help the moment, weirdly taking the contestant's side. The crowd sure didn't help matters either, cheering for the wrong guy in the dispute due to the emotions involved. Alexander then marched over to the judge's table and made it worse. When I said that this, is, this was whack, I wasn't saying this is whack, he declared gesturing to the entire studio. That is whack, he explained pointing to the bottom two. Um, for my personal feelings, it sucks to see two people who have grown to love go home, he continued. That's what I mean by being whack, so I'm not disrespecting this competition. Connick Jr. said, biting his tongue, that wasn't clear. The, the, the defiant Alexander concluded his tantrum. I'm glad I got to clarify that for you. The show went on. Alexander's pal, Joy Cook, was indeed voted off. The Walking Dead is about to get a lot more of Rick and Morgan. That's according to series creator Robert Kirkman, who spoke about the show's comic book origins and seemingly boundless future at a NAB show panel with AMC President Charles Collier and star Stephen Ying on Tuesday. Kirkman provided tantalizingly few specific details about the upcoming sixth season of the Hippos apocalyptic zombie series, but the writer EP said that the dynamic between those two characters that was set up at the end of last season will carry throughout the next. Kirkman said having Rick and Morgan together finally again is a huge deal, and it's definitely going to be a big part of season six. He also added, now it's a very different Rick and a very different Morgan who are going to have to have a completely different relationship. And it's the questions of how they're going to interact, how they're going to work together, if they're going to work together, and what comes from those interactions is going to be basically the spine of season six. Kirkman also teased, quote, a lot of cool stuff with Ying's character Glenn in the upcoming season, which 
may or may not involve killing off the fan favorite. Both men played coy when it came to the possibility of saying goodbye to yet another beloved Walking Dead character. Kirkman joked to a chorus of laughter in the room, we don't kill the popular characters. We don't kill the popular characters. Ying said, if I go, that could happen, adding that he feels lucky to be part of a phenomenon. Uh, if Glenn does die, it's pretty safe bet he won't go down without a fight. Yang said, the way that we make the show, the writers and everybody really wants to focus on making things poignant and purposeful and meaningful. So if it were for Glenn to go, then it's probably going to be awesome. Regardless of whether Glenn makes it past season six, Kirkman and Collier are both fairly confident that The Walking Dead is a series that can live on for years to come. Kirkman said, this isn't the, the kind of show where the creative team is going to say, uh, it's important for us that we end it here. The story that we're telling to, that we're trying to tell is so big, and the framework is set in the comics. I'm producing more than 12 issues a year. All of that stuff is stuff that we would like to someday adapt into the show. He also added, our long-term goal it was to tell this unrealistically massive, huge story. So by going season after season after season, we actually are maintaining the integrity of what we originally set out to do. So I think there's a possibility to go for many, many years. Comedian Ricky Gervais proved himself to be an animal activist this week when he posted a photo of a female hunter smiling next to the body of a giraffe she had killed. The British comedian uh, tweeted on Monday, what must have happened to you in your life to make you want to kill a beautiful animal and then lie next to it smiling? The woman has been identified as Rebecca Francis, a former contestant on the 2010 reality show Extreme Huntress, and she has since attempted to defend her actions by saying the giraffe was old and lonely. The graphic image quickly sparked a social media firestorm with fans of both the extras, actor, and the supporter of the Animal Kingdom slamming Francis. Gervais replied to one Twitter follower, she's so proud of herself, yeah, she probably killed this one to feed the poor locals too. Other followers even wished Frances herself suffer a similar fate. May that horrible woman die a lonely, painful death, another person wrote. However, Frances claims that she was actually putting the giraffe out of its misery as it, it was elderly and close to death. Um, she told HuntingLife.com in an interview posted on her Facebook page, When I was in Africa five years ago, I was on the mindset that I would never shoot a giraffe. I was approaching towards the end of my hunt with a unique circumstance. They showed me this beautiful old bull giraffe that was wandering all alone. He had been kicked out of the herd by a young and strong bull. Francis said she killed the animal to provide food and provisions for the locals. She wrote, I chose to honor his life by providing others with his use, and I do not regret it for one second. They also took his tail to make jewelry, his bones to make other things, and did not waste a single part of him. I am grateful to be part of something so good, she added. On Wednesday, Gervais voiced his sympathy for another animal suffering at the hands of hunters when he posted a, a photo of an orphan elephant. He wrote, heartbreaking, getting an orphan baby elephant through the night after his mom was murdered for ivory. The actor and comedian who recently returned to Netflix with his comedy series, Derek, is also calling for the conservation of African rhinos. He wrote, don't be surprised when people don't care about a cause as much as you do. Don't be deterred either. The Peabody Awards announced the winners in the entertainment categories on Tuesday. Inside Amy Schumer, Jane the Virgin, and Fargo were among the recipients of the 74th Annual Awards, which recognized uh, meritorious public service in the media. The Peabody Board of Judges will also honor FX's The Americans, a drama about Reagan-era Soviet spies. The Nick, Cinemax's historical drama about pioneering sur surgeons during the early 20th century New York Hospital, and HBO's satirical hit Last Week Tonight with John Oliver. The awards will be presented on May 31st as the first ever nighttime red carpet Peabody ceremony. Fred Armisen, a Peabody winner for his work on Saturday Night Live in his series Perlandia, is set to host the gala at the uh, Kiparini Wall Street in New York City. Pivo TV will use the ceremony as a foundation of a 90-minute Peabody special that will premiere June 21st. Woody Allen's irrational man, Denise Villeneuve's uh, Sericrio, Peter Doctor's animated movie Inside Out, and Natalie Portman's directorial debut, A Story of Love and Darkness, are among the films that will screen at the 2015 Cannes Film Festival. Cannes organizers announced on Thursday morning at a press conference in Paris. Other films in the main competition include Todd Haynes' Carol with Kate Blanchett and Rooney Mara, Justin Carezel's version of Macbeth with Michael Fassbender and Marianne Kataria, and Gus Van Zandt's the, Tree, the Sea of Trees with Matthew McConaughey and Kent Wat uh, Wananabe. 
The special screenings will include two animated films, Inside Out and Mark Osborne's The Little Prince, as well as Alan's Irrational Man, Portman's A Story of Love and Darkness, and Barbette Schroeder's Amnesia. The titles were announced by longtime con film festival head Theory Fearmox and new president Pierre Lescure. Eight of the announced films, said Fremonks, are by first-time filmmakers. While two of the main competition titles, the same as last year, are by female directors. Those two are Valeria Donzelli's Margarita and Julian and Malween's Monri. The, fil- the festival has previously announced that George Miller's new Mad Max movie, Mad Max Fury Road, will screen out of competition May 14th, and that Emmanuel Bercot's Ber- La Titi Hate would be the first opening night film to be directed by a woman since Diana Curie's A Man in Love in 1987. Other entries at the fe- festival include Amy, a documentary about the late singer Amy Winehouse, and Mia Madre by Italian director Nani Moret- uh, Moretti, who joins Van Zandt as a director looking to win his second Palme d'Or. He won in 2001 for The Sun's Room, while Van Zandt won two years later for Elephant. Michael J. Fox has been a frequent visitor on CBS's The Tonight Show, but Wednesday, uh, excuse me, CBS's The Late Show, but Wednesday's appearance was his final one. Uh, the Back to the Future star told ta- David Letterman over 41 times, I can't believe this will be the last time. I want to thank you for everything you've done for me and for television. Um, the veteran host to which the, uh, the veteran host said, you are better at doing what you do than I am at doing what I do. The veteran host to, uh, said to which the 5-4 actor quipped, you're taller, you've got that thing going for you. To commemorate Fox's history with the late night show, Letterman flashed up a picture of him from 85 wearing huge wired glasses and a goofy smile. The former team Hot Rod said, those glasses were incredible. I got them from Charles Nelson Riley. If you get wider, you'll see the sleeves of the blazer were rolled up. Uh, Letterman marveled, you got, you got it all going on there. On Monday, the CBS show announced a star-studded lineup for its final 28 broadcast with appearances by George Clooney, Tom Hanks, Oprah Winfrey, Howard Stern, Billy Crystal, and Tina Fey. Other guests scheduled include Alec Baldwin, Robert Downey Jr., Will Farrell, Jack Hanna, Kevin James, Scarlett Johansson, Michael Keaton, Steve Martin, Sarah Jessica Parker, Don Rickles, Julia Roberts, Ray Romano, Paul Rudd, Jerry Seinfeld, Martin Short, John Travolta, Bruce Willis, Elvis Costello, Dave Matthews Band, John Mayer, Mudford and Sons, and Tom Waits. At 68, Letterman holds the record for longest-running late-night host in history. Stephen Colbert will take over for him when he retires in May. Letterman's final broadcast is set to air Wednesday, May 20th, 11.35 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on CBS. Just days after losing a director for Wonder Woman, Warners has quickly found another filmmaker to pick up the reins of the high-profile project. Patty Jenkins, who at one point was to direct Thor 2 for rival Marvel Studios, has closed a deal to helm Warner Brothers' female superhero movie. Warners has moved at a lightning speed to sue up another director after parting ways Monday with Michelle McLaren, the experienced TV director and producer who was who, who was to have made her featured directorial debut with Wonder Woman. Creative differences were cited as the reason for McLaren's de- departure. Selecting Jacobs helps Warners avoid what some saw as a gender bias against women directors helming uh, superhero ten poles. Ironically, Jenkins would have been the first female director on a Marvel movie if she had continued on Thor 2. She will now become the first female director to handle a big project in Warner Brothers' developing DC universe. The studio needed to move quickly in order not to lose momentum on the project, which has been slotted for 2017 and has Gail Gadot to attach to star. Jenkins is also another experienced TV f- filmmaker, although she's actually got her starts in movies. Her debut film was Monster, the indie that won Charlize Theron a Best Actor Oscar, but showing how hard the film world could be for female directors, Jenkins has had a hard time finding a follow-up feature. She did, however, mark a made a mark in TV, including directing the pilot for AMC's acclaimed crime drama The Killing. Nicki Minaj posted a photo on Instagram Wednesday evening of a massive heart-shaped engagement ring on her fabulous manicured left hand, captioning only with emojis, which included hearts, a diamond, a ring, and a true favorite, the monkey with its hands over its eyes. The 32-year-old singer's rock was first spotted in an Instagram posted on Tuesday evening showing Minaj and her boyfriend, possible fiancé, Meek Mill, also a rapper, causing leaning up against a sleep mate black sports car with the caption, Those Miami Nights. 
After followers commenting on Minaj's bold choice and accessories, the singer tweeted the ring, heart, and diamond emojis by following up by, by tweeting, I'll post it later. Though Minaj has yet to confirm or deny the engagement, her emoji-laden messages seem pretty clear. Hunger Games star Amanda Stenberg is calling out several of today's biggest pop stars. The 16-year-old actress who plays Rue in the first installment of the film franchise recorded a video from her high school history class in which she criticizes white celebrities and singers for borrowing from black culture to make money. The video entitled Don't Cash Crop My Corn Rolls was posted to her Tumblr page several months ago but has recently gone viral. Uh, Steinberg says, in the 2010s, pop stars and icons adapt black culture as a way of being edgy and gaining attention. In 2013, Miley Cyrus twerks and uses black women as props. And then in 2014, in one of her videos called This Is How We Do, Katy Perry used ebonics and hand gestures and eat watermelons while wearing cornrows before cutting inexplicably to a picture of Aretha Franklin. So as you can see, cultural um, appropriation was rampant. The video featured clips of Kesha and Kim Kardashian wearing core rolls and Madonna with a grill over her teeth. Footage from Taylor Swift's hip-hop influence Shake It Off video is also shown. Sternberg, who has also appeared in 2011's Colum uh, Columbi Columbiana and the Fox drama Sleepy Hollow, addressed that Azalea Banks criticized Iggy Azalea for not speaking out after a grand jury decided not to indict the police officer who put Eric Garner in a chalk hold. Sternberg says at the end of the video, I've been seeing this question a lot on social media, and I think it's re really relevant. What would America be like if we love black people as much as we love black culture? Time Magazine has unveiled its list of the 100 most influential people in the world for 2015, and some of the biggest celebrities in the world have landed on the list alongside dignitaries, uh, luminaries, and politicians. Kanye West appeared on one of the covers issued, issues out on Friday under the Titans category. An essay about him was penned by SpaceX founder Elon Musk. Meanwhile, Martha Stewart, Martha Stewart was enlisted to write an essay about Kanye's wife, Kim Kardashian, who has also been dubbed a Titan. Taylor Swift not only makes the list as an icon with her essay being written by Law & Order SU, SVU star Mariska Hargitay, one of Swift's cats is, of course, named after her um, Hargitay's SVU character, but Swift also wrote a piece about TV chef Ina Garten. Time editor Nancy Gibbs said, in our annual Time 100 issues, we tell 100 stories of individual influences, but taken together, these stories are an anthem to interaction, the convergence that occurs when a good idea goes viral. The technology that connects us also connects our world of art and science, business and politics. So when we when we were debating whom to approach to write for this issue, we looked for people who could speak to their subject's influence in all of its dimensions. She also added, every year we hope the Time 100 will introduce you to influential people you might not have met before and encourage you to find out more about them. Other celebrities who had nabbed the spot on the 2015 most influential list include actor Bradley Cooper, director Lee Daniels, comedian Amy Schumer, Schumer actress Reese Witherspoon, Chris Pratt, and others. And finally, here is the Billboard Hot 100 singles charts for the week of April 25th, 2015. At number 10, it's Taylor Swift with Style. Number 9, Walk the Moon with Shut Up and Dance. Number 8, Flo Rida featuring Sage the Gemini and Look As with GDFR. Number 7, Love Me Like You Do by Ellie Gooden, which was last week uh, was at number 3 last week. Number six is The Weeknd with Earn It from the soundtrack of Fifty Shades of Grey. Last week it was at the number four spot. Uh, number five, Think Out Loud by Ed Sheeran. Number four, Trap Queen by Feedy Wap, which was number six last week. Number three is Sugar by Maroon 5, which was at the number two spot last week. Uh, number two is Uptown Funk by Mark Ronson featuring Bruno Mars, which was number one for almost a month and a half. And at number one, the, uh, the number one song in uh, the Billboard Hot 100 single char singles charts is See You Again by Wiz Khalifa featuring Charlie Proof from the soundtrack of Furious 7. Last week it was at number 10, and it's the number one song in the country right now. And as your entertainment report for Thursday, April 16, 2015, I'm your host, Mr. Downtown Ray Mello. I'll be back tomorrow to wrap the week up, delivering some of the major stories and trends going on in the world of entertainment and beyond. You can follow the show on Facebook or on Twitter, facebook.com slash the entertainment report with Ray Mello. That's 
R-A-Y-M-E-L-O, or on Twitter at The Enter Report. You can listen to this episode or any previous episodes of The Entertainment Report on iHeartRadio. Just search for The Entertainment Report, and it'll take you to our page. Have a great day, everybody. I will see you again tomorrow. Bye.